This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. Hey everybody, it is Tuesday night. I'm back and we have a ton to get through. I knew it was going to be a, a crazy week just because there was so much stuff that was popping in over the weekend. Some stuff has already canceled even. It's that kind of crazy. And uh, we'll get to it. There are 73 campaigns to get through. So this is going to be a very long episode. I will try to keep it as short as possible for my descriptions. You can always jump ahead. You know how to do that. Um, you can either jump on the timeline or jump on the pinned uh, comment or in the description to uh, check out all the other stuff as we go through. And yeah, let's do that. First up is a canceled game. This was Hold the Line Excalibur Battles of King Arthur. And as you can see, it had many multiples of funding before it was uh, let go. You can always check if something looked like it was pretty good. Usually a reputable place will have uh, something to say in the update as they do here, or maybe there'll be a comment. Here it looks like they just wanted to redo the package. It looks like maybe they were able to bring in more money than they thought, and uh, maybe they could bring in something better or a better representation of the product. Um, if you get a little bit more money, then you can spend it on art and other cool things. Check it out if you are into those type of Avalon battles and uh, would be interested in this type of game. You can also, as I say, usually follow the creator. So Old School War Games has created several. So I'm not too worried about this being like a fly-by-night cancel thing. Just click on their name, click on their name again. And uh, what it'll let you do is hit that follow button if uh, you're interested in the game and you want to know when it launches again. Or, you know, just come back and I'll tell you. Then we usually have an entrant from Queen Games. It's been a little while since they've been able to put anything out. They, I think, are an Australian company, but it says they're from Ohio. As you can see, 63 created. They make these family-type games, and this one is about pirates. Usually they have some offerings for multiple languages and for other games. As you can see, they have quite a few. They redid a bunch of their campaigns and made uh, upgraded versions of uh, previous games. Uh, maybe they have taken that same um, tactic here. Uh, you know, it's pirates. You're going to have ships, you're going to have gold coins, you're going to have sand, you're going to have <laughs> boats, you're going to have all kinds of swashbuckling and that kind of thing. So um, this time it looks like it maybe has a like a checkers feature uh, to it, to how it captures things. Not really sure. Uh, as I said, I have to get through these things pretty quickly. Artwork's always pretty good. Components are always pretty good. And uh, as I said before, you can usually pick up previous games that um, are similar uh, family style uh, stuff that you can get uh, with later campaigns. They're a good one to follow if you like the stuff that they put out because there's always something new from them. They're always upgrading things as well. Then with the Olympics in town, it makes sense to have some Olympic sporting event type games going on. This is Velodrome and it is a wooden board game. I do not think that the wood has anything to do with it other than it is easy to laser cut. And that appears to be how the board is set up and what it's made of. Uh, maybe some type of balsa uh, or whatever they find. Some hopefully not too expensive pieces of wood since the timber prices are so high right now. And you can get some wooden meeples and other things to go with it. Not a lot of pictures, but it looks fairly simple. And you just race around the board with a bike. Then for the train enthusiast out there, we have Mainline Magazine. This is for the 18xx crowd. Um, there have been a few games that fit within this, so I'm sure there are some fans out there uh, that are interested in having a magazine describe more things about the games. This is the Hiawathas, but it is the first issue. There's really nothing else to um, go by other than what they've presented as uh, extra maps and maybe some extra things to do with uh, gameplay. Something about uh, beer. Maybe you can move beer back and forth. Um, but uh, I think it comes with posters and a few other things as well. If you are a fan of rail games, then uh, maybe you just want to dig a little deeper and find out more cool stuff about it. Then we have Finders Creepers. Uh, every game says that it's family friendly. Uh, I don't know if any of those are ever true, but it doesn't really seem like the best selling point. Uh, maybe tell what the game is actually about, and then you'll get people in there and they'll see that, oh, hey, if there was a card or something that wasn't family friendly, I could just take it out <laughs> and uh, play it. You get a free mini if you would like and some type of badge if you back quickly. Um, 
simple type of board. Looks like it's um, the type of thing you would get from GameCrafter. There's no real uh, custom pieces or anything like that. You're just uh, probably rolling some dice and running around the board as, uh, what's that, the game? I guess it's on Twitch, uh, Among Us, uh, where the simplified uh, characters. And you can get plushies of these uh, s simple characters to go as well. Um, family maybe means simple, easy, uh, not too involved with strategy. And I don't know where the tactical prowess really comes from. If there is something with tactical prowess, maybe they uh, will find a way to describe it better. Then we have a video game adaptation. This is Green Hell, the board game. And it looks like you can get a free dice tower if you back it very quickly, uh, right away. <laughs> get it out there as quickly as you can. Um, there's four characters, and you have to survive in the Amazon rainforest. I believe that is what the video game is about. Uh, and you get the same here. It looks like the tower is uh, acrylic, maybe with a couple of wooden dowels with uh, a backing of the jungle. Um, there's a lot of different uh, dice towers that pop up on the 3D printing episode uh, section. So if you miss out on it, then I'm sure you can get something pretty cool to go along with it as well. And um, yeah, so you have these different characters that can act as your guides. You're exploring, you're moving around. Um, looks like uh, there's some type of puzzle involved with these dice that somehow sets your resources, maybe what you find and what's available and uh, whatever you can turn into uh, tools of some kind. Uh, yeah, have not played it. have not played the video game. I kept getting it confused with Green Inferno, but maybe they're close to the same thing. This one here is not a game. This is Meepology, and I think it's something to try to find uh, personality matches. Is this like a Facebook personality quiz that they're charging you for? Hard to say. Um, you can save profiles and different things like that, but I just don't know what is required for this. I don't know that anyone needs this. So, uh, yeah, apparently only 16 of you so far have, uh, figured out that you need it. I'm either going to need a lot more in order to, uh, get it funded. Um, that's what board game geek and uh, the ranking systems and other stuff are for. Maybe they're trying to take that like wine test uh, that people do to uh, try to find out what wine you like, and they're trying to move that into the board game space. It's not the worst thing in the world, but it's also to say which um, games and companies have been um, brought into it. Maybe there's some missing. Maybe there's some that, for whatever business reasons, would not be included. Uh, those are all possibilities. It's hard to say if this is going to be worth it. Like I said, it feels like a Facebook quiz, and you typically don't have to pay for those. Then we have a pretty big one here. This is Excavation Hearth. It belongs in a museum. And there is a solo mode, which I'm sure helps quite a bit. It looks like it is a game about museums and space chickens, if you can make that Venn diagram work. Uh, it is an expansion from the look of it, and you are a group of alien explorers and uh, you're going to find things to put into a museum. You're going to go continent to continent. You're going to have various uh, artifacts that you're going to be picking up and the way that you're going to decide, excavate, market, sell or smuggle. So you're moving things around like they're in a market and uh, you're designing your own gallery. So it's like you're playing Brainiac where you're collecting different pieces of the worlds and uh, or you know the the Predators, when they had all the Xenomorph skulls and all the spines and stuff at the end of Predator 2. Something like that. That might be what you're doing here. Then we are on to Dino Dodge, which is a family game about dinosaurs. And you got the little, uh, let me get the thing up here, little meeple dinosaurs there. Dodging meteors that are falling from the sky. So, have not seen that one before. Seen a lot of dinosaur related games and different things like that but have yet to see one at least in a while about dodging the meteors that lead to extinction so pretty dark um but uh hey it sounds like it's a great way to teach uh your uh, youngins about how uh, things go together to get a five dollar print and play version or a fairly inexpensive twenty dollar version if you jump on pretty quickly and uh 
yeah, nothing too complicated about it. You got uh, various types of boom booms happening and uh, some cute multicolored dinosaurs. Um, yeah, as long as your child's not traumatized by uh, whatever dinosaur <laughs> getting a meteor slammed in their face, then uh, I think it'll be fine. Then we have Dragon Bond, Lords of Vela, and this is another big one. And it's because people like dragons. It has all of these interesting uh, dragon uh, sculptures here that go along with it. So some people I know are just going to buy it for the dragons themselves. Otherwise, it's a $50 game to get all of those models, which uh, a lot of times you can pay that amount just for the models themselves. You can get uh, STFs, or sorry, STLs and PDFs in the print and play. So you can print your own versions if you want a, uh, a less expensive version. And you have this Armies of Blood and Dreams expansion included for that 50 bucks, So you get extra characters to go on top of it. I'm not really sure what type of game it is for playing. Because uh, when you have these types of dragons, it's hard to say, Oh, um, you know, I know you're going to use this for your RPGs. <laughs> and cost-effectively, uh, you're going to be able to get a pretty good uh, value for your money, even if you're just using this for your RPGs. So uh, if you wanted to check it out for the different types of battle games that are uh, in here, I'm looking for player counts, looking for just about any kind of info as far as the game uh, and not really seeing it. Uh, but hey, there you go. You get what you need. There's a couple of... Um, the thing jumped out of the way. Some, uh, some close-ups here of the other characters that you can pick up as part of the free expansion. Artwork all looks great. Uh, it looks like there is some paid expansions that you can pick up as well. There are different uh, knights and other characters you can get. This dude right here, he looks like Carnage, doesn't he? With the, the red and the blood coming out of everything. That might be an interesting use of that type of character. Uh, oh, here we go. And uh, it looks like you can even incorporate them right away into your 5e game. So, um, yeah. That's uh, That makes life even easier. This looks like Pearl from Blade. Remember the, the one uh, vampire that was in there? Little Jabba the Hutt vampire? So, and this one right here looks like a regular vampire. They got a lot of neat sculpts. So, for a fairly inexpensive price, you got a lot of really cool uh, pieces that you get here. Then we have Council, Bug Council of Backyardia. This is one of those Japanese games that's just weird. Um, thing being, a lot of this information is in Japanese. So I don't know if they're necessarily going for English and Japan market or just Japan. Uh, neoprene uh, playmats are helpful and you know stick around for a while and that's nice. Uh, custom meeples are nice too. Uh, Gameplay wise, it seems like you're going to be taking tricks and voting each other into... Um, some extra stuff so things that you would see in your backyard anywhere in the world ants bees cockroaches flies and mosquitoes none of them are your friends but they can all be your uh i don't know council members in this game tabletopia is how you'll play it for yourself if you want to check it out and see how the gameplay goes then we have cartouche this is tile laying and restoring a leg uh, pharaoh's legacy uh another one of those almost tetris type games uh, for one to four players, so you can play it solo if you need to. Um, yeah, as you can see, there are a lot of shapes that look a lot like Tetris, almost exactly like Tetris, but this one doesn't look like the one from a week or two ago that was with dice. It uh, at least has tried to change out the theme uh, into something that would kind of fit, you know, like the walk, like an Egyptian kind of kind of walk that would go with it. Some of these look like they have uh, diagonal pieces, but maybe that's not the case. Um, but yeah, check it out if you are into these types of uh, games where you have to fit the shapes together. Uh, maybe even a little bit like Scrabble, because you got these extra pieces all around, trying to lay the tiles on top of them and, and uh, match them up based on the colors. That might be part of the game here. Traveling back to the backyard, but this time from Texas, we have Turf War. And you need two players, and you're going to be building the best type of garden area that you can. And it looks like you can throw bugs at your enemies uh, in order to make theirs worse. And uh, your, your job is to get judged from dirt all the way up to flowers, trees, and whatever other cool things that you can put in there, like gnomes and whatnot. 
So, uh, yeah, it's an interesting idea. Um, I don't know if that's a sponsored gnome or not. I don't know how much time you have to make a mighty oak happen. But uh, skunk sabotage and crowbars, I'm sure, would do the trick there. And you have various uh, neighbors that you're going to be trying to sway uh, using the types of uh, ornaments you're going to put in your backyard for them using their preferences. And I try not to uh, get too much into your sex lives. <laughs> so maybe the, this is your type of game. Maybe it's not. Um, this says it's for kinky couples. I don't know that kinky couples need a game. They probably have that already worked out. Um, but it looks like they have some Mad Libs that are part of it. And then there's some other little tiny things to go along with it. I'm just going to leave that there for you. If you're old enough, if you're uh, in a relationship enough and you're looking for this kind of thing, you know who you are. This one, I love the pun. This is the bear, down with the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie is a term Marx used. Uh, it's the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. The, the bourgeoisie are the ones that own the means of production. They're the managers. They're the rich people. And then the proletariat are the workers. So if this is some type of like union game. I wish there was more um, going on here. It says it's a D6 game inspired by Honey Heist and Owlbear. Uh, you're playing a proletariat and you're going against the bourgeoisie. Um, I wish I knew more about it. If it's a tabletop RPG, it could be. It says there's players in GM, but I don't know that that's what's going on. There's really not that much information, but I love the title. Switching over to GameFound, Legend Academy just launched, and speaking of great minis, they've got them here. This is by Eldorado Games, and it feels a little bit like uh, Fairy Tale Hogwarts. So you're trying to become tomorrow's legends and uh, maybe there's like a Red Riding Hood and uh, maybe like a Alice in Wonderland and Robin Hood and that kind of thing going on. Yeah, so there they are. There's Alice. Um, so you'll be manipulating the various characters. I've got Twisted Fables coming and that is all the fairy tale I need right now. Uh, they already told me that it's shipped, so I don't really need much. Magnetic board and insert that makes um, everything flip over really nice and be thematic and fit all the pieces. That part is pretty cool. Artwork looks good, but how are you going to top like the girl riding the wolf? I mean, that's, that's pretty awesome there. Alice on her mushroom. Uh, let's see what else we got. Paul Bunyan. But when you're going to put Alice in the Red Riding Hood, it's going to feel more like the woodsman, wouldn't it? And then obviously Robin Hood. So you get different novels to play against. Uh, it looks like that's how the things play out. Standees, uh, similar to Gloomhaven. And quests and puzzles and everything that's told out of the Spiral Bound book. So interesting. Looks neat. Uh, let's jump up and see how well it's funded. Uh, it's doing pretty darn well at almost $90,000. So <laughs> um, it is definitely going to be something that uh, a lot of people are going to have. And you got a little bit of time to check it out and see if you want to be part of that too. And then something that somehow is doing five times that, Aridia, the pass we dare to tread. This is put out by Far Off Games. I'm not sure if they just have a whole lot of people that are out there, but this is an open world fantasy role playing game. So uh, pre painted miniatures means it is very expensive because that's an expensive thing to do. But maybe that's why people are buying it, because they figure it will be a value. They won't have to paint these guys themselves, and they can use them a lot of different games. Um, that part works fine. Uh, but it looks like it runs like a uh, role-playing game that you would play, like Dungeons & Dragons or something like that. Um, but you don't have to have the GM. The game will play itself for you. So that part looks pretty neat. Uh, if you're someone that's always been looking to uh, get a group and you can't ever do it like myself, then uh, maybe a game like this would be perfect. Uh, I've been trying to get through Gloomhaven and uh, Tainted Grail and a bunch of other stuff. So I might think about this for maybe a late pledge. But uh, open world, if you want to play something continuously, that's what uh, this is all about. So you can keep coming back to it and have replayability within your own world artwork as you can see all looks very nice and you might even be able to use these tiles and different components uh, in other RPGs um, 
if you needed to as well. So uh, pretty neat looking deal. And like I say, pre-painted minis is a compelling option, although an expensive one. There we have another Japanese game. This is Three Hands, I think. Uh, this is a bluffing game. It's one of those where they, um, they don't speak English natively, so it's a little harder to figure out uh, where all these little pieces go together. Um, maybe it's fine there. <laughs> but you're going to make hands, and uh, they say it's a board game, but it's really a card game. There's no board. There's the cards. <laughs> so... Um, that's how it goes together. Um, you're going to have 20 cards to get used. You have to memorize uh, to be the most effective, which ones will be available per hand, and how that goes up and down. Um, it's like a simplified poker. There's uh, fewer cards to go in, or maybe it's more like a really streamlined uh, blackjack. If uh, you're into Japanese games, like I say, then maybe this one's for you. But maybe you're a bounty hunter out there in space. That's what Bounty Rush is about. This is from Lessons from a Quitter podcast. Uh, I don't know how many people are following that. But this is their first created. Um, and it looks like it's about some type of galactic government situation. And you get a lot of rules. Uh, a lot of description. Not a lot of pictures. So, um, yeah. Oh, there we go. We see some type of uh, thing. There's a space squirrel. So maybe that's the feel. Is space squirrel and uh, I don't know what an ergonomiac is. It looks like a skateboard that got away from somebody for, for tiny people. And uh, oh, your ship can somehow use magnets to steal things. All right. It's a space game. So we have kind of an idea that's a little bit of a cartoony, quirky thing. Um, but I think that mountain of text that you have to get through to figure out how the game plays um, maybe why it's not setting the world on fire a little more a little more show a little less tell have you ever wanted to be uh, someone who experiences life from somebody who doesn't have things as nice as you that's what education arbitration is about this is not something that's going to make $25,000 because this is mainly for like sociology classrooms. Uh, maybe as in a social studies uh, perspective and the, the section of the, the classroom, maybe your school would pick it up. Um, if it's not too much, <laughs> if it's not too harsh, it's hard to say. Uh, but I think marketing wise, maybe there's a different channel that might be better. Uh, there's certain people that this might be great for, but like I said, uh, it kind of fits for certain classrooms as opposed to uh, living rooms. Then we have a strategy board game, Henry's Feast, about Indian cooking for Henry VIII. I don't know if Henry VIII ate Indian food. Um, so, yeah, that, that part is what throws me off a little bit, but maybe that's a famous deal that he went and, and went there. Uh, a lot of the spices I don't think would have been readily available during his time. Uh, that let you know, you know, what Indian food is all about. Uh, cards look okay. Uh, there are a lot of games about food. So I think there was like two or three just last week. Um, and, you know, it seems to be uh, that pretty accurate here. You got samosas and bhaji and rice puddings and other stuff like that. That's kind of neat. I don't know if it has anything historical because you could probably find documentation of uh, what was offered if there was this event and um yeah buy sell cook and try to win the favor of the king or uh he did not have a problem uh, cutting people's heads off so uh, maybe that's the thing that happens to you don't know but i would expect maybe victoria <laughs> someone a little later would uh would have been over to india uh hard to say back over at game found we got lands of galzer um Gozer would be the one from Ghostbusters. This is a totally different deal. This is a story game. You have one to four characters, and you have these little uh, meeple friends, and um, uh, Quackalope did a pretty good job of describing it. It has already met its goal. Uh, did not, you know, uh, blow things up like that $400,000 one, but it's doing quite well for itself and will probably get up there. As you can see from all the people that are talking about it, it is about story. So as your characters move through the map, you will be generating 
uh, hopefully more than once, um, a tale for the characters. Uh, it looks like there's a weather system. Maybe that's why they're rolling it back and forth that uh, will have a snowy version on the uh, other side of the map. But um, your decisions have consequences. As you move in, you have a long um, uh, journey and the various dice are gonna have um, it's not just where it has, oh, it has two successes or three successes. It's got different types of successes, so you can pick different colors depending on the task that's ahead of you and plan yourself out, try to hope for the best, and there you go. you got lots of colors, you got lots of characters, you got little meeples. If you like telling a story or you want the feeling of someone reading you a story, then maybe this is uh, something that has a little less on the combat and more on the adventure. Then if you did want combat, this is Chivalheart Uprising. This is a war game about chivalric areas. And as you can see, um, not the biggest map in the world, but that doesn't mean that you're not putting in quite a bit of content. Uh, you have, uh, this is not the final map, but I'm sure it'll be pretty close, maybe with some extra details. You got different zones that you're trying to attack or defend, and you have upkeeps to worry about as well depending on who you are looks like there's some fantasy elements because there's some green people there's only two green people there was those green children that i've heard of that are actual folks so i don't think it's trying to be historical but uh yeah seems like it could be pretty neat uh 50 bucks though to get the copy i think with the components um i don't think there's anything super crazy they could have offered a print and play uh, but maybe if you talk to them if you're interested in this they will offer it it just doesn't look like there's anything missing here, and it's basically print and play, print and play already. Then it looks like this one was taken straight out of Fury Road, Dust Biters. This is about rival car gangs and a giant dust storm. So if you're trying to get out of the way, then uh, uh, this is from co-creators of lots of different games. Um, if you enjoyed any of those, I'm sure you'll be okay. So uh, you have various conditions, different types of people that you can be uh, that are going to be played out on the cards. Uh, and you have three actions to try to build your caravan as best as possible and uh, fight off other people. So there you go. If you remember the, uh, the big chase that happened in the sandstorm, then uh, I think there's also one similar in the Monster Hunter movie. Um, but yeah then maybe this will be the game for you. Uh, you know, lots of different fun looking vehicles, characters, that kind of stuff. Probably goes well with the Epic Spell Wars crowd. And we have a set collection game, Photographic World, where you have a bunch of cute animals that you are going around the world to try to get the cards of and uh, match them all together. So, pretty simple uh, idea. Cost-wise, it will run you $24.00. Um, is that right? Is it retailer only? Oh, they made a mistake. So they put the the retailer p pledge first. You shouldn't necessarily do that because um, then it just makes you other people worry. Like, why can't I get it for twenty four dollars? And it's actually thirty nine dollars. So uh, they should have put that at the end, like a lot of people do. And then you have uh, uh, blocks that retailers can pick up. It's like four or five at a minimum, and that uh, means that uh, the people will um, will not feel like they're getting cheated. So first time created, so maybe that's why they didn't quite pick up uh, how to do that. Uh, you know, it's okay, artwork's all right. Uh, if you like these types of animals, it looks pretty harmless. Struggling out the gate, but I'm sure they'll get at least halfway there. Titans of Eden, this is a fast paced deck building game, so they say. Um, they want it to be like a UFC cage fight, so I'm going to guess they're trying to make it more like uh, Soul Calibur uh, or meets Magic the Gathering. So you have these various characters. Uh, the artwork looks basically straight out of um, <laughs> straight out of Magic the Gathering. I don't know. Uh, they're saying that like it's an offering to offer limited death slow gameplay and limited interactions that they are trying to defeat that so that's just uh they need to readjust the page so it doesn't look like that's what they're offering um they want it to be 
basically four elements instead of five elements like you get in Magic the Gathering and uh, you can have multiple uh, interactions to go with it. So um, yeah, if you're part of that Magic crowd uh, and you want to expand out or you don't want to get invested in Magic because it's so expensive to get started, then uh, this would be an interesting alternative for you and you'd still get a lot of that good fantasy art. Then we have another adults only game. This is Tree O. Uh, this is one that looks like it just asks you a bunch of questions and you move around the board and uh, if you have enough uh, libations involved then maybe this turns into something. Um, I don't know that you necessarily need a game <laughs> to kick things off. Uh, but hey, if that's what you need or that's what you're hoping for, you're going to be like, hey, let's try this. And then everybody walks out the door on you. Uh, that might be why it's only got 10 backers so far. But uh, yeah, it, you know, there's a group that needs this. Uh, I don't think it's a lot of people because the last time I had a three-way, the only thing you needed was boredom and booze. So, you know, the cost is about the same as a, as a board game. So instead of Indiana Jones, we got the Adventures of Tennessee James. And, uh, yeah, you got standees, lots of different types of adventure, an interesting cartoony kind of thing. Um, as far as $36, maybe that's okay for a price point for this type of thing. Um, but it's absolutely a knockoff. I mean, you can tell right away everything about it is just trying to be a knockoff of Indiana Jones. So uh, the question becomes... Do I just want to knock off Indiana Jones? Or does this offer something unique and interesting towards itself? Um, it looks like it's following Raiders of the Lost Ark. You have the different uh, characters, such as the guys with the spears and all that kind of stuff. So uh, if you just like that opening, then maybe this works. Um, looks like maybe they've got some ghosts and things that they can throw in with it. But for the most part, it is not as unique as it could be and maybe that's why it uh, is only at this mark when it needs to be about 10 times higher that can happen um, it could be a great game and all this other cool stuff but it just isn't seen as unique enough considering how you can get a lot of these um, inspiration type characters from stretch goals on other games so it can be difficult uh, an uphill battle I'm not sure how well the uh, game that came out purposely from these folks did. Blurg seems to be doing okay. Maybe they'll do better in 30 days. Um, seems to be about making bad drawings and uh, making up words and just otherwise a type of game where you don't have to be good at something in order to play it. And that is awesome. Uh, we play Pictionary with a nine-year-old <laughs> and she kicks our butts and everything. So this type of game where the adults that are terrible at drawing, terrible at guessing, terrible at all those types of things, um, would still be able to have some fun uh, and not necessarily feel like they're inadequate. Um, can you draw better than a fifth grader? No, no you cannot. And there have been a few different Chili Pepper games, and I think this one has popped up before, Chili Mafia. It says it's the first created, but darn does it look familiar. Uh, maybe it's just because the tagline about card game that packs heat because there was one maybe a month ago that did something similar. Uh, Chili Peppers as Luchadors. That's kind of cute, kind of funny. Um, you got time to be an early bird on this deal. If that's what you want, um, then how do you play the game? You got all these chilies. You're going to mix and match them and uh, try to fight off people, things. I don't know what forget about it is, uh, but there's bagmen and farmers and whatever, all the crazy things. But uh, you just, you have the chilies as the thing that kind of everything's built around, but really you're, you're just collecting points. <laughs> that's how it all goes together. Magnetic sleeve friendly case, that's always good. Maybe it'll even come with sleeves, so you can pick those up pretty easily and it'll keep it together. Uh, especially if you're going to be eating chili peppers while you play the game, you do not want that stuff on your fingers, and then you have to go to the bathroom later when you didn't expect it. Also a thing that has happened to me. I was watching Serenity again last night, and uh, 
I was not expecting this one to pop up, but it is very similar. Cyber Wreck. This is a science fiction game about salvaging in cyborgs. So you can get hammers, whatever the brain hammer is, alien on a stick. That should be right next to hot dog on a stick. That would be fun. The good space helmet, not the broken one like in The Martian. Uh, moon flag, which is up there no matter what your uncle thinks. Um, yeah, you got all kinds of neat different uh, characters and some funny things to go along with it. Uh, yeah, so, so there's some humor. There's cards. It's mainly black and white, uh, a conservative use of color, but that's okay. And uh, you can watch uh, how it gets played and all that. The enamel pins, it's got a duck, so I'm sure Quackalope will love it. And uh, yeah, just check it out if you want a quick game about sci-fi. Then we have, every once in a while, one of these uh, vertical board game wall things will pop up. And so here's another one. They call it Game Frame with the PH. Uh, there was a guy who made a thing called Game Frame with an F in the early days of Kickstarter. And I think his name's Jeremy. He was on the Tested.com podcast. And that was like an LCD uh, cube. So this is not that. This is a game where you're playing it up on the wall and it just has the wooden pieces to go along with it. If it's chess checkers or whatever, then uh, you've got uh, uh, the ability to move them around and play vertically because you don't have enough horizontal space, maybe. Maybe that's a reason. And this is not a misspelling. This is how done it, not who done it. Um, it's like clue in reverse. You know who it is, but you got to figure out the other pieces. Um, you got to figure out how the person committed the murder as opposed to just who it is. And that's a little bit different. It could use a little more art to describe how that all uh, goes together. And if they did throw that in, then I'm sure that there's enough uh, mystery-loving individuals out there that uh, they can get more than a dollar. Then we have the return of the samurai game, Immortal Arms. So it has a little more conservative... Uh, goal in mind which they've already reached and then uh, yeah it's about the honor of Bushido in a martial arts duel the artwork is pretty good uh, I think we said the same thing last time and you get all these different uh, fun characters to go along with it and uh, yeah if you like the Japanese world you like uh, the feudal ideas you like samurai then this is maybe something in your wheelhouse then this is a flip game about drinking what the flip there are many like it. Usually, the, I guess you use cups. But in this instance, you're going to use the cards. I think that's how it ends up functioning. Uh, yeah, you, you flip a co the coin and it lands on something. And then you do whatever is on the card. Looks like, or perform the task. So it's not flip cup, but you do all these other things. Eh, I've said it before, I'm not much of a drinking game person. I'm more of just a drink and enjoy yourself kind of person and or play a game. So if you still are in that 19 to 23 range where this is still a good idea, then maybe you can jump on it. Then we have another collection game, much like the one that was like the space artifact game. This is Epic Zoo. So you're going to be collecting animals to put in your zoo as opposed to... Uh, artifacts put in your museum two to five players you need someone to compete against uh, they have translucent cards available in the premium set and if you like animals if you like the idea of uh, making the best exhibits and where they animals might live and things that they might have and enjoy the transparent cards fit over the biomes so that you can see the animals inside of the exhibits that part is pretty cool. It's an interesting idea. And I have not seen that specifically combined with this type of game before. So that's nice to have something kind of unique. And most of the time I will just ditch all of these things that have to do with elections, especially last year when we were going over it because they were kind of one note. This is uh, election night in America. It is not an election year. And it seems to be uh, a, more about a wide breadth of, uh, <laughs> of things that it could be not just um, the two-party system we have, expanding, expanding it out into a four-party free-for-all. Um, we do have lots of parties. It's just, you know, the, the system has uh, managed to find its optimization with two. 
Um, you're going to go around gathering electoral votes. There's nothing here necessarily about issues. It's more about gathering uh, candidates and doing different things um, to gather the votes and thinking about like how much each state is worth. So it's pretty um, neutral. You don't have to sit there and worry about any one individual's politics or anything like that. It is just about catching the votes in the states and counting them up. So I find we'll include it. This is the last board game though. In the set, we're going on to RPG stuff. First up, we have Hair, the evil bunny Halloween metal dice. So you get D6s that, uh, you know, they're cubes, but they got little faces like jack-o'-lanterns and things on them. They can be a little bit difficult to see in the black, uh, but the white ones are uh, a little easier, at least in the way that the renders run. There's numbers. So, you know, if you want something that fits, if you want something that feels uh, Halloween-y all the time, then uh, maybe you can pick these up. If we look at the um, September is when they want to do the delivery, but it's coming from Australia, so that may take a little extra time uh, to get them shipped, but it should be in time for Halloween if they manage to get it out in September. And then we have uh, Medieval Marginalia. Um, these look like the guys that fit in the margins of Medieval maps, so maybe that's where this part comes from. Um, you know, little creatures. So fox people, um, it's hard to think, like, what is it that each of these was supposed to be? It's usually some type of description of another type of animal that somebody got wildly wrong, and uh, that's where it all comes from. They look pretty cool, where the wild things are kind of style, and I'm sure that's where they got their, uh, their inspiration from. You can see here what kind of weird craziness um, they were inspired by. 13th 14th century crazy stuff but uh you know if some people are a fan of that kind of work and uh, i think it's uh it's very inspiring and kind of neat that they they managed to make it in 3d then we have the graveyard stls there are plenty of these available uh you just have to pick and choose and see which ones you're going for some have many more trees that are highly more detailed some of them have skeletons some of them have other things that go along with it this seems to be mainly grave markers and a single tree. So if you want something simple, easy to, get to work with, then uh, this will probably work out very well for you. Uh, you might even be able to get some good use out of this for FDM because it doesn't look like the, even the tree limbs are all that uh, crazy. Then if you need for summer fun, um, some women in bikinis, summertime STL have 75 and 32 millimeter models uh, for you to paint. So that's the, the kind of style you're going along with. Uh, no violence, nothing too crazy. Um, depending on the work you do, it's probably safe for work. Uh, nothing that you wouldn't find in like a uh, just a general um, Sports Illustrated from uh, the, I don't know, 70s, 60s. Then you see the yellow, then you see the pink, and you know that Borg Borg is upon us. This is Death Race. This is OSR Rules. Uh, that you can put in OSR games, but otherwise it's for Morkborg and you have people competing against each other in a deadly race. Um, this is a fantasy style world, so uh, depending on, is it Amazing Race style where it's on foot? And is it going to have uh, horses? Is it going to have chariots? Is it going to have dragons? What is it going to be? It uh, looks like they've got fancy footwear and other things that you can unlock as well pretty neat um there's always coming they are always coming up with new stuff for Morkborg, and uh you know that's it's it's interesting the time and place that it it functions within the apocalypse as it occurs as opposed to after uh, so you can do a lot of crazy things just the world's going to hell and why not throw a death race on top of it then to go with your grave setup you might want yourself a gm screen this is an enamel uh, laser cut uh, with acrylic piece GM screen that you can have uh, little pieces at the top as you can see with the uh, clear acrylic um, you might be able to hold monsters and cards and other things up there uh, heavy duty um, it can withstand a lots of things being put up onto it and uh, yeah it's pretty awesome uh, it's compatible as you can see with everything because you get to decide what goes onto it there's no tables or anything you can put that up for yourself 
and uh, it is expensive. <laughs> so uh, just be be aware that you're making quite an investment, but it is going to be looking pretty snazzy. Then we have a simple campaign, a little tiny one. This is a 5e location supplement for 3 to 5 characters. Uh, level 3 to 5 characters. For the Wailing Fen. So you get some new monsters and a couple other things to go along with it. There is your map. Um, four monsters in total. Two dungeons will come along with it. And you get weather and geography effects on top of it. And the settlement is called Mistleton. So maybe you take it into Christmas with the mistletoe, and there's descriptions of each of the little settlement parts that are within it. So something simple that you can uh, plug into whatever campaign you're already running. Ouroboros miniatures are back, this time with the sun and moon. Highly detailed characters. So you're going to be paying for it, but uh, you'll get the value as you can see. Um, Cost-wise, they are about 50 pounds. Or sorry, uh, yeah. 50 euros a piece, um, but very highly detailed. You can make adjustments, and I don't know if there's a game yet that goes along with it, but these would definitely be, um, you can stick them in Warhammer, you can stick them in Kingdom Death. There's a lot of versatility. Otherwise, you can make yourself just an awesome uh, diorama that goes along with it. Lots of uh, beautiful sculpting that you can use to highlight your painting skills. Then if you play the game Chivalry and Sorcery, this is a European folklore bestiary to go along with it. You can see artwork is pretty neat. Um, it looks like they are going to do a lot of the things that are not specifically made for uh, another game. So things like furballs um, are part of Irish mythology, I believe. Uh, so wherever they pick them up from in Europe, uh, looks like they got some dire wolves and different types of... Uh, imps and whatnot. I'm not sure where uh, this snail would come from. Just about everywhere has a sea serpent and um, hopefully those things will get unlocked as things go along and uh, you know it, you get what you need. Uh, I'm not sure if you need this for any other types of games if it will work for anything because uh, most of this stuff has already been covered uh, because it's been uh, as I say not necessarily open sourced but uh, public domain for a very long time. And if you're in the market for a quick tabletop system to be able to create dungeons with, this is Mystic Realms uh, version. They have low walls, so you don't have to necessarily um, have to shove your fingers in uh, with the high walls, making it difficult. Uh, this allows you to also see kind of what's going on over the whole map. It's nice to have things, you know, with the high walls. They look nice sometimes, but it's mechanically easier if you have the low ones. And uh, you might want to switch things up with what they've got. Uh, as you can see, you can put a pretty large uh, set of uh, collections together. Uh, as these uh, three and a half inch pieces all slot in. And I don't think they're magnetic, but they might be. But you can get various sizes. And basically just make whatever floor you need for your dungeon. And uh, they've got all kinds of grates and doors and other things that will go along as well there you can see he didn't necessarily trip over it but uh he's definitely reacting so that's what you got going on then we have arcane arcan uh this is a way to share homebrew D, &D content but there are a lot of other websites already out there so it's hard to say uh why this one should be better or will be better or who's behind it that makes it better uh there's having some type of app access. This is entirely up to the community that wants to be behind it. But here's the thing. All those community people, if they have something good, they want to sell it on the DMs Guild or they want to sell it on um, some other place. So it's hard to say where all of this um, should go. Now the thing being, if it does go on the, the DMs Guild, you got to give uh, Wizards access to your stuff. They easily could just decide to take it from you and put it in a book. And there's really not a whole lot you can do about that. Um, but that's part of the deal. Otherwise, you come on places like Kickstarter. So do you want to go to Archon or Arcane? Um, are, you gonna, are other people going to go there? Is there going to be top tier content present there? Hard to say. But that's what you risk if you want to believe in this. 
then you put your money up and then hope for the best. Napoleonic Wars have been quite popular in the minis department, uh, not necessarily in the last couple weeks, but definitely earlier in the year. This is the Price of Crowns, and it comes with more for 1806 to 1812. So if you want any of these uh, French 28mm miniatures in metal, then uh, you can get those. If you want to 3D print your own, then there is an option for that. These ones look pretty good, uh, a little bit higher detail actually than ones we've seen previously in the year. So if you were waiting on something from before and you want something a little more realistic looking, then maybe these guys are what you've been looking for. Then I think I put this in the wrong place, but that's all right. This is Almanac Crystal Peaks. And it looks like it is a board game uh, about travel. So you get yourself an almanac, you wander around, and uh, depending on where you end up, you get uh, various fantasy creatures fighting against you on that. So you get Treacherous Trails expansion and the Dragon Road. Uh, as well so depending on how you want to run your journey it's one of those travel type games um, yeah you can even upgrade your tokens and that kind of cool stuff or maybe you find that you want to upgrade these for another game and it'll work pretty well too they're all made out of wood and uh, you can use it just about anything you need to then we have monster wrangler is this fantasy pokemon it might be that might be what it is um, which might be hindering it a little bit uh, to have those types of comparisons. Um, it's a simple system. You get a dice pool um, with D10s, and that's how it runs. Um, it's anything is seven or higher, I think, is uh, the way it goes. And you can have modifications from there. And then you get monsters. And these guys look like Pokemon. So there's that. You get lots of different uh, types of uh, attacks and different things that could be related to it. So uh, if you wanted to tell a different story, you didn't want necessarily that anime um, world that was created uh, by those folks, then uh, maybe you'll try the one that is presented here. Look at that. You can get Dinobots. So all kinds of neat things. Um, they're trying, but you know there are much bigger games out there that are comparable, so it's an uphill battle. And we go a little darker with Forbidden Lands RPG. This is Book of Beasts and the Blood March. So um, this Swamp Thing looking dude is pretty cool. Uh, you are going to be getting the bestiary uh, for this game. In the Blood March is a campaign book uh, with the Legacy of the Horn campaign. Um, these guys look really awesome. Looks a lot like Adrian Smith artwork. Uh, the stuff that was... Uh, I think it's Adrian Smith. The guy did Truvang, Trudvang. Uh, a lot of that work, I think, was him. Um, the Trudvang Chronicles. They look great. It's a little old school, but uh, that means it's also absolutely stunning. Here it is. Henrik Rosenborg is the person doing it. Uh, and some other folks as well. So, uh, maybe I shouldn't have said Adrian Smith. <laughs> but uh, still... It's fantastic. That is, n he's not a bad artist at all. He's a great artist. It's just a matter of did he do these ones or not. Um, so yeah, if you want uh, to join the Forbidden Lands RPG, um, uh, it's a Swedish deal. There's over 2,000 people have already jumped in, and I think uh, the art is what's selling it. And if you've had a problem with nameplates for your characters, then this is a nameplate creator STL. So it looks like it's a piece of software that uh, allows you to 3D emboss uh, nameplates for your different characters, different fonts and all that. Um, if it's easier than using the stuff that I use, then that part's great. If it's got stuff already set in for the sizes of your characters and um, maybe helps it depending on the type of printer you've got, then that would be really nice. I think you're going to absolutely need a resin printer in order to make all the fonts stand out. I have the same type of problem um, with the stuff I make uh, with my FDM printer. So, yeah. Uh, you could do this if you needed to. Uh, as a breakdown of what it is. You can do it if you needed to. It's going to take a lot of work with things like Tinkercad. Um, but this would be a lot simpler if you wanted to shell out, what are we looking at? $33 uh, to start with and then you get uh, a lot of assets to go along with it. So if it's what you need, if you like that nameplate, 
then that'll be helpful. Then it's probably worth the money. And then we have another campaign, Ex Libris for Morkborg, which is another group trying to make a digital um, market for RPG content. So um, they say it's already live. They've already got uh, something going on with it. Um, but they want more money to uh, hire people, I guess, to do more stuff. So um, if you have found that Morkborg content has not been able to be located with the various websites that currently exist, then maybe this is helpful. Then we have A Night at Blood Moon Cairn. So this is a roguelike horror dungeon uh, for 5e. They say it's supposed to be for second tier characters. Uh, so that's a few levels in, uh, basically. And this is set to deliver in September if you get the PDF. You'll be ready to go if you need a horror game with uh, lots of interesting intrigue and all that kind of stuff for Halloween. Um, as you can see, 20 bucks to print it. Uh, the library, what is the library? Uh, you get a bunch of NPCs and other stuff to go along with it. They're trying to do sell-ups, but otherwise you get yourself an adventure um, that uh, is supposed to be about gothic, eldritch, and environmental horror. So uh, that part's pretty neat. Um, I'm sure you can integrate this with anything from Van Richten if you wanted to. Um, the blood moon is going to rise in eight hours, so you're trapped in an area and you have to figure out how to get out in eight hours, so that sets a timer and that keeps things simple. So, you know, it's worth your 20 bucks. Give it a shot. But maybe you're a sci-fi gamer and you want to go to the moon. Would you like an international moon base that you could 3D print yourself? Here you go. You're all set. So this is, um, there are no moon bases right now. <laughs> so this is a speculative design. Um, of the modular components that maybe one day will uh, be up there when we get up there for a permanent settlement. And crossing the line into funding as we were talking about it, Modular Realms Magnetic Terrain made its way in. So if you wanted a double-sided flat pack, easy to store, easy to put together magnetic terrain, then these guys might have you covered. Uh, it looks like it's mainly for fantasy, but grass is grass. You can play whatever you want. This one's a little weird. Um, this is uh, Neoclassical Greek Geek Revival, the Acidic Edition. I don't know if any of those words mean anything, but <laughs> the idea is these are going to be, uh, I believe, uh, older um, types of characters and things that you would find. Uh, like, uh, let me roll it back up here. So this type of guy who's like a, a, a ram or like horned beast gnomes things like that that are from old fairy tales and that kind of stuff i think that's where they're going with this um if you're uh, intrigued by the the ram with the third eye and all that kind of stuff then uh, maybe you'll pick it up then we have omega horizon rpg this is a new tabletop rpg about dystopian futures so like cyberpunk that kind of thing uh, Point-based system, so I'm going to guess it's more like Pathfinder 2E than it is uh, 5E. And um, nature versus humanity and artificial intelligence are themes that they want to throw in there. And they've got a bunch of different characters, different types of empires, as you can see uh, with the artwork. Lots of aliens, maybe some free peoples, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so check it out. It's uh, a lot of art, so it looks kind of the same. <laughs> um, here we go. There's a person. There's a, a, a someone fighting, but the rest are basically like ships and things. Uh, but uh, a space lizard, maybe? Space fish? Is that what that kind of person is? And they got lots of arms and other things, uh, ways about them. I wonder if this is what a T-Rex was actually colored like. I wouldn't be all that surprised. Uh, and then like avatar creatures and mechs. Hey, we got mechs. So lots of different things in the future you can check out if you like Knights of Sidonia and that kind of stuff. Maybe this is for you. Then we have the Uncharted Lands. This is the Lost Adventures campaign and uh, the all-in-one STL collection that goes along with it. So you can print these things off 
play the game and have all the new cool stuff that you would like. Um, the description, it's 120 pages with a different theme. Um, with 10 standalone adventures and maps and everything included within it. Uh, stat blocks and player options that are all 5e compatible. Um, then it looks like you have... Uh, these are not tokens. These are uh, just uh, little bits of locations and sub-races. Um, Pure Blood, T-Call, Galari. Uh, none of this, these words mean anything to me, so you have to read it and figure out what they do. Uh, the Igneous Domain Cleric, so maybe that has something to do with fire or volcanoes. Ethereal Warden Fighter. Pact of Frost Warlocks, so maybe they have a pact of... Uh, uh, if the pacts are the weapons that they use, uh, not the patron, but a frost giant god or something would make an interesting patron. And the Oath of Grief Paladin, if that's their own grief or grief they give to others. From There's lots of interesting ideas there. Pretty good artwork. Uh, all these folks are, if you're fans of any of their work, are the ones that are working on the standalone parts of the adventures. So that part is cool. I do not know who Danny Herrero is, um, but I think the strength of these miniatures has boosted it up right there to the top, so you can see how well it's doing. Then we got dice, shiny, shiny dice. They've got uh, foil, hologram kind of things in them, so they could look frosty, um, they can look lots of different ways, and uh, you can pick up different colors to go along with it. Um, they have rounded edges, or you can get them with sharp edges. You can get whatever that unilope thing is, unicorn bunny, whatever they would be called as their mascot, uh, and lots of different styles. Uh, there you can see it in bright light, low light, the way that the reflections and all that work. It's a neat deal, um, but at least in the various lighting conditions, you can read the numbers, which is what I love. Being able to read the numbers after I roll. And if you want a dice box to put all the dice in, there is these trans, or sorry, not translucent, phosphorescent, fluorescent, not phosphorescent, fluorescent. I'm running out of words, folks. It's been a long episode, but you get a, a maze look to it. If you're a fan of Westworld, it looks like the maze that was in the first couple seasons, but uh, thrown into a triangle, because why not? Um, also looks like a... Uh, like a, a triangle when you play pool <laughs> so but i guess it's a lot smaller in order to have dice um wine red coffee colored translucent white whatever colors you would like to put uh on the inside that's all up to you i'm smelling burnt toast and i really hope that's because someone's actually making toast and i'm not having a stroke it's a long episode i get it i know I'm trying to get it done where Legends Stand, this is a set of 3D printable thematic bases. So you get 1,825 STL files of dirt and mechanical stuff and terrain and all that kind of cool business. If you do have a resin printer, then you're going to be in a lot better shape. Um, but you get different themes. Aztec Spirit, Mosaic, Urban Apocalypse, Eldritch Scrap, Flagstone, Blood God, Cyber Hexen Dungeon, and then uh, different sizes and things that go along with it. So if you were going to play in any of those types of worlds, you get any of those types of armies, you get any of those types of characters, then uh, having a lot of variety keeps you from getting bored and lots of stuff to choose from. Price-wise, uh, it looks like $15 gets you everything uh, that you need. So it, it's not that expensive. Um, and it looks like you get a lot of cool stuff. There are spikies and different things on, so that's why I say probably resin only because resin does the best job of the spiky stuff here's where the real money is avatar legends the role-playing game so if you play in uh if you want to play the nickelodeon legends of korra or avatar the airbender then in that world then this is for you this is their officially licensed version of all that for magpie games you guys know i'm not into anime so I will move on to Dragon Eye Dice, the Chromatic Dragon Collection, where you can stare at you in the eyeball. Um, they're neat looking, different uh, types. Uh, they have chosen a different style. I don't know if this is the 6 or the 8, but it allows you to see the eyeball a little bit better. Um, and it's a great idea. So if you want something very 
unique, something that is a little nicer. Um, they put bubbles on the uh, insides, and that's what allows the uh, the eyes to always be looking at you. Cause they'll kind of like roll around. So that part's pretty neat. And I misplaced another board game. This is Greatest Investor, and it's a turn-based strategy game uh, about building the best assets. So if you played any of the games about selling stocks, bonds, a lot of the rail games are kind of like that. Um, then uh, this is similar. So you're going to be picking up assets, moving around, and uh, trying to acquire the stuff with the highest value. Kind of like Monopoly, but less rent and moving around ports. Then we have a 3D printable village. This is Highland Village, and it's ready to go by 3D Rogue. Um, if you were missing any pieces, if you didn't have uh, one ready to go. You didn't want to pick one up from the Billings guys or uh, WoW Buildings or any of the other places that have had medieval stuff already. Then uh, maybe this one will be more to your liking and you'll, you'll pick this one up instead. Much smaller scale, much more intimate. We have the hybrids. These are files for STL uh, printing as well. You're going to need um, resin. This is more of a diorama kind of view of people in the far future that are like half uh, half animal, half human, uh, living in maybe a, uh, it looks like there's an air conditioner at the top. <laughs> so maybe living in a world, um, where they work at a power company or something like that. It's a little retro, uh, in some extent, it feels a little bit like, uh, what you would get with, uh, Fallout. But, uh, if tieflings were in Fallout, then maybe this would be the right way to describe it. Then the Verdant Isles are one of those RPGs where you have uh, anthropomorphic animals and fairies and all that kind of stuff. I think this came about maybe uh, during February when we had all the stuff with uh, Zine Quest, maybe. Sounds familiar, um, but this is just another way to play that. You get 200 pages of uh, these tea time adventures and uh, lots of different people talking about it. Um, one shots. That's what you get. So if you're going to play with younger folks, you wanted to teach them how to run 5e. Uh, these are supposed to be disabled friendly. I don't know how that works. Uh, which disabilities they're friendly for. Um, just be friendly. I think then you'll be plenty friendly and be inclusive. Speaking of inclusive, uh, maybe there's some LGBTQ characters in uh, the book. It's supposed to be friendly for that too. And here we have anodized aluminum dice. And instead of showing numbers, they show words. So uh, it's just a matter of choice. They have multiple colors on them. I don't know if this is a pride thing. I don't even know if Russia knows what that is. <laughs> um, but uh, that's what they have. Some rainbow dice with uh, English words on them. Um, and you can pick them up if you'd like. So price-wise, uh, you get two dice for $22. So what's that, $11 a piece? Um, so yeah, these are all D6s, so I'm not sure how many of them you would actually need, but they come in various colors um, before they're machined or lasered, whatever the case is. Then we have a Diesel Punk Carbon Gray uh, RPG. This is for a D6 system that is not 5e. Uh, this is, uh, I don't see that it's Savage Realms either. Savage Worlds, sorry. Uh, but uh, it's kind of in that same vein where you have simple D6 systems that... Um, you can just jump in and, and play whatever uh, resolution you need to. 40 bucks uh, gets you the book, and then you can get for 149 all of these minis and other cool things to go along with it. So uh, not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things. If you think about how much your minis and stuff would already cost, uh, you can use these in other types of games and or maybe use other games in this game. That part's up to you. Um, yeah, you're going to be fighting a war. Are you going to be the sovereign, the free lady? You got the royals. Um, I don't know if the reluctant mentor means you have to carry a library on your back. It seems to be what it looks like. Spies. Uh, Fenris Wolf as a character. That's interesting. Trench fighters, all that kind of stuff. So, neat ideas. Lots of different enemies. Uh, cool things that you can be and maybe you can even incorporate it into like a game of scythe 
Fortress of Gaia, 3D printable terrain. This is a fort. Looks like it takes place in the future because it's got guns. So uh, wherever your uh, open lock uh, terrain leads you, then maybe it will take you into this fort that you can run around. It has garages and doors and other cool things on the inside and outside. Since it's open lock, it's compatible with a lot of different stuff. Project Mobius has been a creator of a lot of that as well. And you can contact them if uh, maybe you see that you want this one and you would like something else as well. You can contact them and find out where their other projects are available. And I hate to end on a disappointing note, but it kind of is. This is Bag of Goons, affordable bulk minis. You can buy a lot of uh, like army men style uh, things for 10, 20 bucks. You can buy hundreds of them on Amazon. So you're competing against that in which case I need more than one one sculpt are you just getting a big old bag with lots of goblins in it um because there's nothing else here and I think that's really what's holding it back uh not showing off all of the different goons and things that might be in there it's a great idea you need henchmen um you can turn any NPC or sorry you can turn any model into uh, a significant NPC or mastermind if you have tons of goons to go along with it so that's that take a look see maybe they'll uh they'll throw more in um but i would i wouldn't expect much if they don't show off more check it out i still have somewhat of a voice 73 in it's late at night if you want like and subscribe that's always helpful and i'll be back on friday this was like an early first of the month kind of week a lot of people will try to get the 30-day campaigns out there right away so that you'll have the whole month to kind of figure out if you want them. So I would expect uh, the remaining episodes to be a little bit easier to get through, uh, a little bit less stuff going on, but still a busy summer because people have been working on their pet projects for a long time and are going to continue to do so. And as things return back to normal in the shipping world, we'll probably see a lot more of these uh, campaigns jump up uh, and be competing for your dollars because they got to keep people working and uh, the, the removal of that uncertainty is definitely going to push things forward. So I'll catch you on Friday. We'll see where things go. Uh, Suicide Squad. If you don't hear from me, I'm watching it.